those kind words. And thank you for putting together this incredible multi-year, multi-nation uh, project, even while continuing to write and produce terrific works of philosophy, uh, including the recent book on relativism, which is terrific and I recommend to everyone. Um, I'm very sorry not to be there, as Maria mentioned. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've always enormously enjoyed my visits to Armenia, and I was very much looking forward to this one, but um, such is the state of the US bureaucracy that uh, getting any travel papers on time these days can be very tricky. So unfortunately, that didn't work out for this time. Um, I'm very happy also to be contributing to this project. So um, you have all been treated to several days of a conference addressing what people are calling a crisis of trust in science and expertise. By the way, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have slides. I'm not typically a big slide person. So this time it's just going to be me talking, I think it'll be quite easy to follow the argument. Um, but um, um, if you're used to slides, then I'm afraid uh, I don't have any for you. Um, so the phenomenon, of course, that I'm sure you've been discussing at great length is that it seems that many people these days, instead of listening to what the best expert opinion is telling us about climate change or COVID vaccines or election results, hold beliefs that are at variance with the best evidence that we have on these matters. You've all heard the main examples. I'm afraid mine are all drawn from the US context, and I apologize for this parochialism, but um, um, as a philosopher, it's uh, remarkable that I know any empirical facts at all. 30% uh, of the US population believes that global warming is caused either by normal patterns or does not exist at all. 25% are inclined to believe that the COVID vaccines are unsafe for adults. And perhaps most shockingly, one third of the country believes that the recent American presidential election was rigged, that Biden won through vo voter fraud rather than fair and square. And in each and every one of these cases, the evidence that these claims are false is abundant and seemingly available. Certainly that evidence is much discussed on the airwaves and in the newspapers and the media in general. So how do so many people come to believe the opposite of what the evidence indicates? What or who is to blame? Well, as you know, and I'm sure you've heard over the past three days, I wish I'd been there to hear some of this, many theories have been proposed to explain how we ended up here. Some blame the internet for the way it enables the fast spread of misinformation and encourages encapsulation in information silos or echo chambers so that the views you start out with keep getting reinforced without being subjected to counter evidence. Some blame self-serving and lying politicians who endanger the public good for their own benefit. Others point the finger at science itself and the way in which the occasional scientific scandal may have eroded the public trust, or they blame science for not communicating effectively. I'm also part of a group in Germany which is studying uh, you know, whether science is communicating its results effectively or they blame it for straying beyond its proper boundaries of expertise and making value recommendations. Still others look at the academy and especially at the postmodernist movement in the humanities and social sciences, which has been raising doubts about the very possibility of objective knowledge or objective truth. And so has promoted a kind of skepticism about the privilege that we accord science. Now, I don't want to deny that some of these factors may be playing a role in explaining our current predicament. But what I do want to argue is that at the most fundamental level, I believe the problem is actually far simpler and that the blame for our current problems actually lies with all of us and with the kind of society that we have built. And here, as I say, I'm referring 
primarily to the United States, though I would be very surprised if these things didn't carry over to many other countries as well. We are to blame for the situation we're in. That's my thesis and that's what I will explain. So um, why is it puzzling uh, that people have come to hold these kinds of beliefs? I think the answer is it's puzzling because by and large, people are rational. They conform by rational, I mean, they conform their beliefs to the evidence. Yet in these important cases, they seem to be deviating wildly from what the evidence supports, and this requires explanation. Well, in what sense are people by and large rational? Well, let me say first a quick word about rational. A belief that's irrational is not a belief that's false. Indeed, it may not even be false at all, it might be true. Rather, it's a belief that's not supported by the evidence that you have for it. So if you buy a ticket for a lottery and you have the firm belief that you will win the lottery, that belief will be irrational, even if it turns out to be true and you do win the lottery. It's irrational because even though it turns out to be true, you had zero evidence that you were more likely to win the lottery than somebody else. Unless, of course, the lottery was rigged in your favor and you knew that. So a belief is irrational if it's not supported by the evidence available to you. And a person is irrational if he or she has a tendency to form beliefs in a way that's not proportional to the evidence that there is for them. In this sense, then, if you look at ordinary everyday behavior, it's remarkably rational in going about life, crossing the street, climbing the stairs, ordering food, driving your car, whatever, you're constantly being exposed to new evidence and rationally adjusting your beliefs accordingly. These mechanisms are, are there in you and they're exercised all the time uh, in, in these completely rational ways. Of course, we're far from perfect in this regard. None of us is perfectly rational. We all experience occasional lapses especially when strong emotion is involved, but it is the norm and departures from rationality get called out and need explanation. So when we come across a large scale deviation from the available evidence, as we seem to get in these cases, it's a puzzle. And when they concern matters that are as important as these, we really need to know what's going on. After all, we're talking about matters as important as the future of the planet, the potential death of millions, and the viability of democratic forms of government. So the stakes could not be higher. You might think that puzzling beliefs are nothing new. For example, even before the Trump era, nearly 50% of Americans believed in ghosts, 24% in reincarnation, and so on. But one difference between my examples and these is that these are all examples of beliefs that are for which there is no adequate evidence rather than examples of beliefs that have been refuted by the available evidence. And there is a difference between these, that is beliefs that for which you have inadequate evidence and you sort of end up believing something, well, that's a certain kind of irrationality. It's, not, it's, it's definitely not good, but it's, um, it's less puzzling than cases where there is a lot of ref evidence that refutes the beliefs that you end up holding. Now, um, you also might think that people believing propositions that have been decisively refuted is nothing new either. For example, there are and always have been kooky conspiracy theorists out there, people who believe that there never was a moon landing, that the whole thing was faked. That's also true, but we're talking there about a very small number of people. It's easy to live with the claim that there is a small number of kooks amongst us it's much harder to live with the claim that a third of the population is kooky. In any case, calling someone kooky is saying, I don't know why he believes the crazy things he believes, but I don't really care. Of course, we really do care why so many people believe things that threaten the very existence of the planet or democracy or all of these important big things. So I define puzzling beliefs as beliefs that seem irrational because they seem to run counter to the available evidence. And the big question we face when we ask ourselves what's going on here is whether this appearance is true or illusory. 
as when we figure out what's going on here, should we conclude that people only seem irrational or are they really being irrational in holding these beliefs? And this question, of course, is important both for science and for society. For science, it's important to figure out how belief, which is supposed to be responsive to evidence, could deviate from it in such a large scale way. And for society, obviously, it's important to figure out what's going on because we might know how to fix the problem if we're dealing with basically rational people who have been misled in various ways. If instead we're dealing with an outbreak of mass irrationality, we may not know what to do since we really don't have good ways of dealing with irrationality, let alone irrationality on a massive scale. So the answer really matters um, to you know, whether we're able to do something about this. Well, before we get to considering explanations, um, we need to make two basic distinctions. Um, one of them is between two types of question. I'll call the first A-type questions for access, A for access type questions. These are questions that ordinary folks can settle for themselves. They can get access to the relevant evidence and are in a position to evaluate that evidence for themselves. Versus what I'll call expert type questions, so E-type, where ordinary folk either lack access to the relevant disconfirming evidence or are not in a position to evaluate it for themselves and so must rely on the expertise of others. Of course, in ordinary life, we come across many questions that we can settle for ourselves. But much ordinary life is, of course, pervaded by questions that are E-type, expert type, questions that we can't settle without expert help. If you car is broken down, what's wrong with it is going to be somebody, a mechanic is going to tell you, or if you have pain in your stomach, what's causing it, that's a doctor and so on. Think of all the questions that you have to Google or Wikipedia and so forth. Now, the puzzling examples I cited above, the belief that climate change is unreal or that COVID vaccines are unsafe or that the election was rigged are all basically E-type cases, expert type cases. Although I think the one about the election is closest to being an A-type case, but I, I won't have a chance to talk about that much here. In such cases, you either don't have access to the relevant evidence yourself, or even if you did, you would be unable to appreciate the justification for yourself to believe the right thing on these topics. You need to rely on expert opinion. So the situation that we have, the epistemic situation, is that the experts have the evidence and they make it available to us through journals, newspapers, pronouncements, government officials, and so on. Of course, if for whatever reason you don't trust the experts, then you will end up ignoring this evidence and it won't have the appropriate effect on your beliefs. The, the lack of trust will explain why your not, beliefs are not conforming to the best evidence in these cases. And the question of the rationality of the puzzling beliefs that you may end up with is, um, is becomes the question, were you rational to withhold your trust from the experts and listen to other people? And that's the, that's the question I will mostly be addressing. A second important distinction has to do with whether the question at issue is a purely factual question or a practical one. For example, the question whether climate change is real, whether the COVID vaccines are safe and effective, or whether Biden won the election fair and square are factual questions. They concern whether something is true. However, the question whether it's rational for you to take COVID vaccines. Hello? Um, Um, is not just a factual matter. It's a question about whether you have a reason to do something, not a question about whether you have a reason to believe something. And you could very well believe that the vaccines are largely effective and safe while thinking that on balance, it doesn't make sense for you to take them. This might be because of the special circumstances you find yourself in, you're young and blah, blah, blah. So um, those are the two distinctions between access type questions and expert type questions and between a purely factual issue versus a practical issue. 
So I want to turn now to looking at E-type cases where you have to rely on expert opinion. And here, of course, you get a, a very natural set of questions that you must have had a lot of discussion about over the last few days. What is an expert? What is it to trust an expert? How do you identify who the experts are? And when is it rational for you to trust them? <clears throat> now, I will, take, I will say something about each of these with most of the focus being on the third, how do you identify who the experts are? So for present purposes, um, the notion of an expert on a given factual topic can be taken to be fairly unproblematic. It's somebody who knows a lot more about the topic than ordinary folks do and who can pronounce on it with considerable and justifiable reliability. What about an expert on a practical question, e.g. whether it's good for you to take a given vaccine? Here, it's not enough that somebody knows a lot more about the relevant factual issues. The person must also know what is in your best interests. And of course, also have your best interests at heart. So but not know what they are and want to tell you about them. And of course, that in most cases will be a much higher bar to meet um, because you know, it's, uh, in an, on an individual basis, there are so many idiosyncratic facts about each individual person that um, you know, certainly the TV pundit uh, who is on the airwaves and who says you should take the vaccine, well, is not taking all of the individual facts about you into account. Let me turn to the question of what is trust and what it is to trust someone, uh, specifically to trust them as an expert on a given topic. Ronald Reagan, the uh, former US president, when asked whether he trusted the Russians to abide by the terms of the nuclear arms control treaty said, trust, but verify. Now this is cute, but a little bit nonsensical because of course to trust someone involves relying on them without having to double check, verify that what they're telling you is true. That's the whole point of trust. And without some measure of trust, most of us could not learn much of anything because much of what we know, we know by being told. So in effect, Reagan was saying that he didn't trust the Russians, but there is a version of Reagan's thought that I think is correct. And it has been well brought out by Dan Sperber, Gloria Rigi, and their colleagues. Um, I think you've heard from Gloria in this conference. As they pointed out in a famous paper, there is a distinction between trust and blind trust. While we have no choice but to trust experts on a wide variety of topics, that doesn't mean that we do not or should not exercise a certain kind of what they call epistemic vigilance about what we are being told. We check on what, whether what we're being told is internally coherent or coheres with what we already think we know. We check on whether the source in question still qualifies as an expert or whether she has somehow fallen out of touch with the most recent developments uh, or whether the source is straying from what they're truly expert on and so on. So being trusting is consistent with being vigilant in these ways a good knower would trust, but remain vigilant. So Reagan maybe should have said, not trust, but verify, but rather trust, but be vigilant, which would be perfectly good advice. Let's turn next to the, to the question, how do we rationally identify who the relevant experts are on a given topic? I was once in a debate with uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate in economics, who recounted the following story. He said he was invited to lunch by people he didn't know and who said they wanted to talk about climate change. Well, when he got there, he found out that in fact, his, his people who had invited him were climate change deniers. And Kahneman said he then thought to himself, well, I treat the folks in the National Academy of Sciences as experts on this and their consensus among them is that climate change is real. And so I believe that climate change is real, but these guys treat these other people as experts and those people deny that climate change is real. Uh, who am I to say which experts you should trust? And at the time I found myself surprised, uh, even outraged 
at this remark by the Nobel laureate, don't we have much more reason to trust the members of the National Academy of Science as experts rather than, I don't know, arbitrary internet experts or whoever it is that these people were consulting. The people in the National Academy have a string of extraordinary scientific accomplishments behind them. They, they put people on the moon. They virtually eradicated polio. They came up with the science underlying computers and the internet and so on. What string of accomplishments do the arbitrary internet experts have to their names? Well, maybe that's a bit of an unfair description. Climate change deniers and vaccine hesitant people can always count on there being at least a few well-credentialed scientists who have rebelled against the consensus. And these days with the internet, it's much easier for any denialist to find out that such prominent rebels exist. And the fact that such scientists exist along with certain other factors like distrust in government can offer some rational support for the denialist view. You can point to these people and say, look, you're not, not everybody agrees. But it doesn't make the appearance of gross irrationality go away because to side with a few fringe figures over the overwhelming consensus of climate and other scientists still seems very irrational. So how could Kahneman say what he said? Uh, how could he think that his lunch companions were epistemically blameless in picking the fringe experts rather than going with the consensus of the members of the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. Well, Kahneman didn't explain, but I now see that we can offer the following argument on his behalf. Let me put the, the, the main point very succinctly. Um, for many people, the question which experts to trust is itself an E-type question. That is, for many people, the question which experts to trust on a given topic is a question that they cannot settle for themselves, but need expert help in order to do so. There are at least two dimensions to the question how to identify the relevant experts. One, what criteria should people use to figure out who counts as an expert on a given topic? And two, how do ordinary folk go about rationally telling who satisfies those criteria? As examples of, of question A, we could mention, why should we prefer experts who have degrees from top institutions and membership in national academies to those who are not credentialed in these ways? Why should we prefer people with a track record of impressive accomplishment to those who don't have such a track record? Why should we prefer the views of the consensus to the fringe outliers? As examples of question B, we could mention, how do I tell what the top institutions are and how do I tell who's got an impressive track record and who doesn't? Now to some of us, these questions, the answers to these questions will seem obvious, questions that we can more or less answer for ourselves. To others, the answer will seem far less obvious and may well not be answerable without expert help. So to whom, we can ask, will the answers to these questions appear obvious? As you might expect, they will appear most obvious to those among us who have received a good education, one that includes an appropriately deep study into what it is to inquire into the truth about the world in a rational way. Such an education taught me not only about the institutions and content of science, it also taught me inevitably along with it, how to think critically and scientifically for myself. So if you have received a decent education, you learn about the phenomena that science tries to understand. You learn how complex those phenomena are how difficult it is to make predictions about those phenomena that are accurate, and how remarkably accurate many scientific theories have been. You would learn just how remarkable it is to have been able to shoot a rocket from Earth and have it do a soft landing on an asteroid that is coming in from the furthest reaches of the solar system, traveling at 25 kilometers per second to be able to 
rendezvous with that thing, land on it gently and come off. Or what an achievement it was to discover the structure of DNA and now to be able to edit DNA. I mean, the list is endless and mind boggling, you know, in physics and fundamental particle theory and uh, such an extraordinary array of, uh, of disciplines. Um, you also learn, as you learn all of this, about the peer review process and how tough it is to get something accepted by a top journal, how incentivized scientists are to criticize the views of other scientists, to check on them and so forth. So a proper appreciation of the magnitude of scientific achievement of the genius that underlies these achievements would naturally lead you to have a great respect for science as a knowledge producing institution. And while learning all of this, and inevitably, you would also learn how to think to a certain measure scientifically and critically for yourself. It's not possible to teach someone a decent amount about what proper critical rational thinking is without also teaching them how to think critically and rationally. So at the end of a decent education, you not only end up with a trust in, indeed, maybe reverence for the institutions of science, you end up with a trust that you can see to be rational by the very critical faculties that you acquired when you learned what it is to think critically and scientifically. So for you, the question about why it is rational to trust science was, as it were, satisfactorily answered a long time ago and answered through the use of your own critical faculties. In effect, what I'm saying is that with a proper schooling, the question which experts to trust is an A-type question. It's a question that you can settle for yourself because you have been equipped with the tools um, to, uh, to settle that question for yourself. You can see for yourself how extraordinarily impressive the scientific method has been in understanding the world around you. The kind of critical faculty that is thereby cultivated also enables you to exert the epistemic vigilance that Sperber and others talk about, and which allows your trust in expertise not to be blind. Now, you might think that it's an objection to what I've been saying, that the question which experts to trust can occasionally arise in a meaningful way, even for a highly educated person. It's absolutely true that the question which experts to trust can arise in a meaningful way, even for highly educated folks, but it's not an objection to what I've been saying, but actually supports it. So take, for example, the question whether cryptocurrencies are the future of money or whether they are just a Ponzi scheme with which to defraud unsuspecting folks. Now, because a currency like Bitcoin is such a new concept, resting on previously unheard of technologies like the blockchain and so forth, most of us will need to rely on experts to figure out what to think. But who should we listen to? Who counts as an expert? Well, you might think the answer is easy, you know, uh, given that you had a proper education. You might think, who are the experts on money? Surely the chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, the, the largest bank in the United States, will do. But he says, and he says, cryptocurrency is all nonsense. So JP, Jamie Dimon, who's the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, says, this is just, this is nonsense. But of course, I'll sell it to people because... I'll make money that way, but um, it, 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 it really is um, it really is a, a, a nothing phenomenon. But is Jamie Dimon really the right person to listen to? Because we know from history that sometimes an idea can be so new and transformative that even the best of the old guard can't recognize its value. History provides many examples of such blindness. So maybe instead, we should listen, say, to the inventors of the various cryptocurrencies. However, those folks are interested parties with a very heavy investment in persuading you that cryptocurrency is the future of money. So their views, while worth hearing out, can't be taken as reliable yet. So we don't know who to turn to. This is an actual situation. If you ask me now, who should you listen to among all the people pronouncing on cryptocurrencies, I, I, I wouldn't know the answer. Um, as we can see then, a choice of expert can be a real conundrum 
even for educated people. But it is a conundrum in those cases, precisely about questions about which there isn't an existing scientific consensus. Because questions about cryptocurrencies contain so many new features, critical scientific reflection has not yet been able to fully process what it would be correct to believe about them. So far from showing then that the existence of such cases shows that education makes no difference to the question of who to trust, it only reinforces the privileged place that critical scientific thought has for us, because in those cases where there isn't settled opinion, we don't know what to think. What I've been arguing then is that if you have received a proper education, one that includes not only learning about the great achievement of scientific thought, but inculcating a certain amount of that skill in you, the question of who to trust on most well-defined topics becomes relatively easy. And indeed, that is how it seems, doesn't it? I mean, here we are, we are a bunch of highly educated academics getting together in conferences, scratching our heads about how could people believe uh, the things they believe or allow themselves to be misled by fraudulent experts. The matter looks easy to us, but how does it look from the vantage point of someone who has not received our kind of education? Suppose all you have to go on is a very basic education from a generally bad public school system, such as the one in the United States, most of which you will probably have forgotten by the time you are 30. So here you are in early adulthood, having to make up your mind about whether to take a new vaccine, a right? matter of maybe of life and death or whether to believe in something as elusive as global climate change, or even whether to believe that the election was not rigged. In such a case, it's very easy to see how you might not only know the answers to our questions about how to go about identifying the right experts. So, but you, you just, it's very easy to see in that situation how you might not know the answers to the questions about how to go about identifying the right experts. Why should you prefer the views of the consensus of the members of a national academy to fringe outliers? And what is a national academy anyway? And how do they arrive at consensus? Is that forced on them perhaps by outside forces like the government or money? And who has the most impressive track record? And what does that mean anyway? For someone with little knowledge of the achievements and in institutions of science, there's, these can seem like very difficult questions to answer in a rational way. If through no fault of your own, you grow up not knowing the answers to such questions, you can easily find yourself in a quandary with respect to them from which you cannot extricate yourself through purely rational means. To rationally resolve this kind of question, you would need to know which folks count as experts, uh, However, which folks count as experts is itself an E-type question for you, and so itself requires reliance on experts, and this threatens what we call a regress of justification. If you are in this predicament, it may very well be a rationally irresoluble matter for you which experts to trust. And once such a rationally unbridgeable gap opens up, it can only be filled with rationally arbitrary factors such as charismatic persuasion by a politician, such as propaganda, such as political solidarity with others who think the same thing, a disinformation, information silos, and the like. In the educational system, as we currently have it in the United States, there will be many folks who will suffer from irrationally blameless uncertainty about how to go about identifying the relevant experts on a given topic and when to trust them. And for these folks, it's totally understandable that their opinions will be manipulable by factors and actors in a way for which they cannot be wholly blamed. What's the solution? As I say, once you have arrived at the point where the question who to trust as an expert is itself an expert type question for you, you have no rational way out. At that point, you're at the mercy of various irrational factors and actors. So the only solution for a democratic society that does not want this to happen is not to allow so many of its citizens to arrive at such a stage. 
And the only way for a society to prevent that from happening is to ensure that they receive a very properly grounded education in the only real respect that counts, that is a full appreciation of the powers and achievements of critical scientific thought. Now, I can imagine two objections to what I've been saying. First, even many highly educated people whom you might think would have no difficulty with our question about who counts as a scientific expert are climate change deniers or vaccine resistant or believers in the great lie about the election. So for instance, take some of the politicians in the Republican party or Robert Kennedy Jr. who is a, who is a big campaigner against the vaccines. So how can we say that a proper education is the solution when you have these examples of highly educated people who nevertheless exhibit the problem. Second, I've said that those who have been taught both about science and how to think scientifically have no difficulty figuring out that it is rational to trust science, but how did we arrive at this happy state? Wasn't it just by having it drilled into us that scientific critical thought is the right way to form beliefs? So why isn't it that what we have here is just a sophisticated form of brainwashing. If all that's going on is I've been brainwashed one way and we call that rational, how can I rationally insist that others come over to my way of thinking? It's, it's just one brainwashing for another. So I will say something about each of these objections in turn. You know, if you ask about these educated Republicans, well, you know, I don't know how many of them really believe what they say they believe. It could be that a lot of it is just expedient political posturing. And by the way, this also goes for uh, certain of the replies that, um, that non-politicians, ordinary folk give in surveys because they, they, they think that pollsters are likely to be liberal media and they um, don't want to um, satisfy them. But at least as far as both the big lie and vaccine hesitancy are concerned, the studies show that a lack of education is the best predictor for whether you will fall for these falsehoods. The situation with climate denial, as I understand it, is a little more complicated, but then that topic is the most remote from everyday experience and concerns and uh, has many special features, I believe. That said, I should emphasize that I don't for a moment think that a decent education would make all of these problems go away, obviously. There will always continue to be uh, such a thing as motivated irrationality, where you allow your desires for something to be true to cause you to ignore or suppress the evidence against it. That doesn't necessarily go away with education, we know that. There will continue to be the influence of propaganda, which we know from history, can be effective even with educated people. There are quite a few educated Turks, for example, who to this day deny the Armenian genocide. You can even get a problem from being too intellectually sophisticated and falling for sexy but ultimately nonsensical views, as we have seen with the rise of postmodernist thought in the academy. According to such views, there's no such thing as objective truth or knowledge, rather all truth is socially constructed at a particular time and place and reflects the contingent values of those who create it. My favorite example of the proponent of such a view is the very famous French philosopher and sociologist of science, Bruno Latour. When French scientists working on the mummy of Ramses II concluded that Ramses had probably died of tuberculosis, Latour, sticking to his guns, wrote a famous paper in which he questioned their findings. He said, how could an ancient Egyptian pharaoh die of a bacillus that wasn't discovered until 1892 in Berlin? That would be as anachronistic as saying he died of machine gun fire. That's what he actually wrote. So we see, you know, even very smart people can end up saying uh, remarkably silly things. Um, so it's not, um, it's not a guarantee. Um, one of the things that underlies such social constructionist relativist ideas, as we've just been seeing from um, Latour, is precisely the thought that lies behind our second objection, 
what makes critical scientific thinking the best way to approach an inquiry into the truth? As the ancient philosophers realized, you can quickly run out of answers to such questions. You know, if somebody says to you, um, why is perception a good, sort of, a good source of evidence about the world? It seems that you would need to use perception to try to answer this question. Why is logical thinking the right way to think? It seems that any answer will itself employ some logic. However, if such circular justifications are allowed, then maybe other methods can have such circular justification as well. Maybe if you read tea leaves, the tea leaves would tell you that reading tea leaves is the best way to figure out how to inquire about the world. Now, philosophers are paid to think about such issues, but you would have to be mad to think that the outcome of these reflections may very well be that tea leaf reading is just as good a way of inquiring as science is. No sane person is in doubt about the probative value of the scientific method, even if it would take a lot of philosophy to explain why that is the right attitude. The ordinary person who is in a quandary about which experts to trust is not doubting that there is a fact of the matter about what to believe or that there are better or way, worse ways of doing so. That person has simply been let down by our educational system so that questions that to us are obvious seem to them to be hard and to leave them vulnerable to manipulation by various different kinds of irrationality in, in, inducing factors. That's why I said at the beginning that is it, it is we who are ultimately to blame for the current state of affairs, because as citizens in democratic societies, we have allowed our governments to neglect the education of their citizens to the extent to which they have. And I will stop there in view of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for going to the heart of the issues involved and explaining the problems and your solutions so clearly and eloquently. So uh, uh, I'm trying to find out how to look at people on Zoom as well as uh, here in the in the audience uh, for questions. Do you, can, can you allow me to see who is on Zoom for asking questions? Are they visible there? I Meanwhile, think if people raised their hands, we could see them. Can you see them, Paul? There, because I can't. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can see. I can see the the windows and various people. I don't see anybody with a raised hand yet. So. Okay. All right. Good. So we'll start with the live audience and see if uh, Zoom works as well. So if you raise your hand, then the, okay, thank you, great, many times. All right, I can see people on Zoom, so please feel free to raise your hand and I will call you in. And then also the audience, you have to wait for the microphone to be brought to you. So uh, may, maybe I can see show of hands when you are ready to ask questions. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pogosian, for a very interesting and very uh, exciting presentation. This is uh, uh, this is interesting to, to see that your approach in uh, sitting in New York University, it is very common in Armenia, it's very relevant for Scandinavian countries. So we, we live in a world where the truth and information and false information has become a central key issue in everything. My question comes from the attitude to sociological review. I remember our, my background is sociology, and I remember that in my university, this, uh, yes, I, don't know. I think if you held the microphone a little further away, yeah, like, yeah. thank you. The theory of social relativism. The theory of social constructionism and relativism was vital for us as, a, as an education. So it was a part of our education as a knowledge of sociology curricula. Uh -huh. And on the other part, you said that formal education is not enough or is not a guarantee or indicator to uh, select uh, 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 experts or to, to as an indicator of expertise. Uh, 
so what is your perspective? Uh, do we need to update, upgrade university curricula, modernize them, or do we need to have uh, out of no formal education to be more in critical thinking and to be more innovative in 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 shaping this um, very critical and really uh, meaningful context for experts. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. It, it's and it's very rich. Um, I, I'm I'm so I'm very interested to find out that um, social constructionist ideas are taught. In, uh, I know I know it's the case in the humanistic social sciences here and certainly in the humanities and it'd be very interesting to to find out exactly how that's playing out in many different parts of the world so I was very interested to hear about that now um, you you asked the question uh, what I mean I'm, I'm I'm hoping that there is a conception of education that doesn't even require you to, go to university in order to have the elements that I'm discussing. Um, that, this, that this kind of un understanding of what scientific thought and methods are and the accomplishments that they have been able to achieve, of course, is something that can be taught at high school if it's, if it's done, if it's done right, uh, if it's emphasized properly. I mean, you know, what's really struck me about the reason um, uh, th this has to be a key component, although people have found ways to make controversial exactly how much education will, will, will buy you, is that I just look at ourselves, I look at how we're having this conference and thinking, you know, what's gone wrong? The world has gone mad now. Uh, because we have no difficulty identifying who the relevant experts are and trusting them on questions, you know, on which there is settled scientific opinion, unlike the Bitcoin case. And um, why is it why is why is it so seemingly easy for us, whereas it seems so complicated for them? And I think um, there there can be. Uh, very little controversy that that the the facts that I'm pointing to are the the main explainer. I mean, you know, that's why I think, you know, when people say, "Well, look, there are information silos and the technological uh, developments have made it possible for people not to be subjected to the counter evidence." Well, this is all true, but you see, we don't suffer from this so much because we know that we shouldn't live in information silos. Why do we know that we shouldn't live in information silos? Because we know what rational thinking is about. We know what rational inquiry is about. So you, you think, I don't want to just be subjected to things that reinforce my view. I'm going to look to see if there is counter evidence for what I believe. So of course, you know, I'm talking about high level academics, but, but you know, the kind of skill, cognitive skill, that's evident in the kinds of things I just now described is a kind of skill that your car mechanic will use when they're trying to figure out what's wrong with your car. I mean, they have to be little scientists. They have to have the hypothetical deductive method. They can hypothesize one thing. If that doesn't work, look for other things. All of those things in that domain, they have absolutely no difficulty in, in executing. And the only thing that needs to happen is for the skills that are basically already there to have application in a much wider domain. So that's why I think it, it's, it's, it's not so much that we have to change the university curriculum, though I hope that uh, eventually social constructionist and relativist ideas will disappear from that curriculum. <laughs> But, uh, but what we need to do is simply strengthen the aspect of high school education that teaches people what the benefits of critical scientific thinking are. Uh, Ashok Balayan. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Professor Barasan, for, for, for this lecture. Uh, I hope I, I, I was able to fully uh, 
at least understand the main points that you brought up. And um, so, so humans are smart. We are rational, and and there's apparently obvious falsehoods that people continue professing or continue claiming to to believe. This could either be explained away um, as if um, it benefits them, as if they they profess this for stressing their social identity, or they're in such a peculiar social standing that they're professing this weird beliefs benefits them somehow. Um, uh, you know, so so some someone might claim the moon landing never happened because they benefit something from this, maybe. Well, Facebook clicks, maybe some friends from his uh, very peculiar social environment, um, and others might be saying, "No, no, no, landing happened to get other clicks from other people or get other, you know, reputation from others." So one way to explain beliefs, either terribly mistaken or hopefully true, is basically wagering to get certain benefits. Um, so I wonder if this is well, according to this is what we do, and 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 I ask this question because towards the end of your lecture you brought this uh, questions that well logic seems to be another sealed system where we if someone asks why do you trust the logical inferences you're like well look at this logical. <laughs> reasons or arguments for support of these other logical, logical arguments, or why do you trust perception? Well, look carefully and you'll see, you know. So is this, are we just wagering or are we rather have a priori possibly or just this system in our reason that forces all humans to endorse particular views and other people, some basically don't hear to their own reason well enough, or they just pretend not to listen to their reason well enough. Makes sense, but please let me know if it doesn't. Uh, so let me see. Um, look, let's, let's first of all take this issue about um, what is at the foundation of the the, let's call it the scientific method. That is, if somebody says, uh, yeah, yeah, I know about your scientific method, but um, you know what makes it, as opposed to tea leaf reading or astrology or something, the right way to inquire about the world? Okay. Now that is a, the, one of the deepest philosophical questions. Okay. It really is a question of philosophy. It's, it's, it's the kind of thing that, um, you know, uh, you wouldn't usually encounter. And, and philosophers are paid to take these kinds of very far out possibilities seriously. So, you know, one of the most famous kinds of skepticism within philosophy is skepticism about induction. Who would have thought induction? So this is where, you know, if you see a thousand swans that are all of which are white, it's rational for you to expect the next one to be white, okay? And you have seen no other color. It's rational. It may not be true, there are black swans, but it's rational. Now, it turns out <clears throat> that the very clever philosopher David Hume came up with an argument that basically says induction can give you zero reason to believe that the next one will be white. Zero. That's an amazing, shocking, skeptical argument, and it, it, the argument is serious because it's not clear exactly how to answer it. It's what philosophers are paid to do. But no one thinks it's going to be a real result of that kind of uh, engagement with very clever, skeptical hypotheses that the result will be that not we should stop using induction. Instead, if we see a thousand swans, uh, maybe we should consider saying, oh, well, then the probability is very high that the next one will be green. Nobody thinks that, right? So there is, there is an issue we study in philosophy. But, you know, it's as Hume said, when you leave the study, you leave the skepticism there as well, because it's not, it's not a real option. So what I'm talking about is not 
an education that tells you how to answer the question about the skeptic. It's one that says, you know, take for granted all the things you do anyway in normal life, induction, abduction, logic, uh, perception, and so on. Notice that when these are regimented in a certain way, they lead to achievements of a scale that is mind boggling to this day. Okay, and that by itself um, will in most people both give them an appropriate respect for the achievements of this method, as well as some inculcation in the method itself, which will enable them to see that their uh, trust in the method and and reverence for the method is itself rational. That's the that's the story that I was uh, that I was uh, telling. Um, I mean, the, as I say, the relation of all of that to inquiry into the philosophical foundations of scientific method is is a whole other matter. Oh, if I can put a question to you uh, before moving to, moving to the public, one issue that has been discussed quite a bit over the last three days, and it may be uh, lurking there in the background of some of our audience's thinking, is that to trust experts, you don't we don't need just to know about their competence, but also about their benevolence. Right. So uh, at least among some pockets of uh, groups and individuals, trust breaks down when there is lack of certainty about benevolence. So, yes. so vaccine hesitancy about among certain groups, etc. Complex stories about uh, institutional injustices that have led to this lack of trust. So can your account, which sort of in my corner is called uh, knowledge de uh, deficit model of uh, explaining distrust, can your account accommodate that other concern that, that the experts need to show benevolence and not just competence in order to be trustworthy uh, experts? Now, wonderful question, Maria, and, and absolutely germane. Um, <clears throat> um, as I, I was, I, I made a distinction that I didn't then do a lot with just because of time. Um, between practical questions and factual questions, mm -hmm. right? And so let's take uh, the question of benevolence with respect to each. I mean, you might think benevolence will arise even in a purely factual case where what you're looking for are epistemic reasons for believing one thing rather than another. But really, I take it in that case, uh, you know, you'd have to think that the experts were lying somehow, that because it's not a question of them having your best interest at heart. It's a question of whether they're going to tell you what the evidence really is. And I don't really see many, many realistic situations in which that's going to be a problem. Uh -huh. But with respect to practical questions, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I believe that the, therefore the practical, the, when there is a practical decision, there is a huge number of uh, things that can stand in the way of uh, trust. Uh, one of them, as I say, isn't really just about benevolence. It might be ignorance on the part of the expert about the, all the different idiosyncratic conditions that you are in, you see, as an individual matter. Um, so, you know, it's, it is very hard, actually, I mean, to, to, to give advice uh, about what it makes sense for someone to do um, that takes into account all of the different uh, particularities of their situation. And furthermore, as you say, since there is a history of a certain amount of um, manipulation of people, um, there is a fairly rational distrust that you can have in the benevolence of certain experts, especially if they are identified with being government experts because people are mistrustful of the benevolence of the government towards them. So um, I completely agree on the practical matter, it's, but it seems to me that if you're focusing on the factual and the epistemic, I, 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 I'm not really sure I see a great deal of room for worries about benevolence there. Can, can, do you? 
Well, uh, we, can, we can discuss this later. So I'm chairing this session. I, I, think I, 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 I want I, to have a dialogue. <laughs> so, uh, Alain? Oh, sorry. There's a, Alain, I had missed a question over there. This, this, this hall is a bit too large for me. Yeah, if you go first, and then Alain will come. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to continue pressing on the point that Maria's just made. Um, it strikes me that a lot of distrust of science is actually rooted in the sense that scientists have powers, kind of magical powers almost sometimes. So if you think of the COVID um, vaccines and others, that, that was often associated with the belief that they were using those to plant chips in people. Um, to control all other kinds of things. Um, so I don't, I, I'm really skeptical of the idea that the issue is that people don't appreciate the power of science. I think they do. I think they think in fact, science is kind of too powerful um, and that actually the distrust is rooted in something like a sense that they're being deceived or not having their interests taken into consideration. Um, so that, that was one point. I also wanted to press you on on what form do you think the education that's lacking um, would take? Is it kind of increased awareness of the scientific method? Because on the one hand, you could say, well, your proposal amounts to undermining the expert relation, because I mean, for all of us here, we are all academics. So we are all probably safely in able to be included in that bracket of experts. We're not scientists, but we have a grounding in the philosophy of science. So would the, would the proposal be that the public needs to be brought up to our level of awareness so that they have kind of our appreciation of science? And I'd, I'd find that maybe just unworkable because not, not everyone wants to learn about it. Um, so yeah. Yeah, very good. Very Two very, very good questions. Um, maybe to start with the second one, what level, you're absolutely right, what level of awareness, I was very careful to say, I, I didn't think that an education in philosophy of science so much um, was, was required, though, you know, the full story may well stray into that area. But rather, I'm, look, I'm just, when I ask, it's not just, in fact, you know, if you're a philosopher of science, you probably take certain questions seriously that, 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 if you didn't stray into those domains, you wouldn't. So for instance, um, um, what I'm, what the, the bit of me that makes it very easy for me to trust scientific experts, consensus among the national academies and so on, is that I know, first of all, about the complexity of the problems that science has tackled and solved in many cases. I mean, mind boggling, okay. And secondly, I know the checks and balances of the system. And I know that um, the kind of method that's being employed at the most basic level is a method that we all actually employ in settling everyday questions for ourselves. I mean, we all use induction, abduction, logic, and so on, uh, it, it routinely, and have an appreciation of the of the, the, the power and indispensability of that method. Um, so when you when when you put all that together, I mean, I'm putting aside right now the issue about benevolence and interests and so on. It seems to me that by itself, if you got this education in high school would by itself give you uh, not just a respect or trust, a reverence um, for what people have been trying to figure out. The idea that these iPhones that you're holding with all of this power and everything that they're able to do is just a matter of crunching zeros and ones. I mean, once you have a full appreciation of what, what that means, I, I'd be amazed if you, if, 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 if you, you didn't come away with a tremendous respect for what's going on. Now, now the, the evil bit, um, you know, to what extent has, has that institution, along with all of its accomplishments, its checks and balances, its respect for, for uh, critical scrutiny and all of that, um, how much is it, to what extent has it been tainted by an, a link with governments, governments that have agendas, 
uh, where the, 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 the opinion has been manipulated in order to control people in certain ways. Um, well, I mean, I, I, you know, there are such instances, but I, I don't, I, they don't seem to me to be uh, sufficient to um, make you mistrust the entire institution uh, of science and, uh, and the, the national academies. Um, you know, the, the putting chips in people, <laughs> first of all, what, what is the, what, 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 what's the episode on which that's based? When, when was the last time that scientists have collaborated with the government to put chips in people? Secondly, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you know the woman said, you, clearly there are chips because the, the fork is, you see, magnetized and it's not falling off her chest, kept falling off her chest. I mean, it's, I would love to know, as I say, there is really the following issue that I take very, very seriously, that um, it, when it comes to an action, to what recommended as a thing for you to do, including to take the vaccine, that is going to be a function of so many other things beyond just what to believe. What to believe? You should believe that the vaccines are safe and effective, at least as far as all the evidence that the scientists have at hand is concerned. But whether it makes sense for you to take it is another matter, and that's sensitive to your own idiosyncratic situation. I mean, I still think on balance, probably everybody should. Um, but, but I can imagine somebody getting into a rational confusion about that. But um, I hope that's an answer to both of your uh, questions. Thank you, Paul. Alain? Uh, right. Uh, when it comes to chips, uh, I guess uh, uh, people who argue um, the risk and, and fear of chips uh, being implanted at the same time bring Alexas into their homes and, you know, uh, right. and, and, and have their cell phone track them everywhere. And, so I think there's definitely irrationality involved. But taking away this discourse away from rational basis of these decisions, I think there was a Lynn Terrell's talk yesterday was helpful in that she's also looking at not so much the, uh, the rationality of the decisions, but more as from the sociology of it, uh, in that this kind of discursive practices and how, um, you know, uh, because if you look at, at any kind of self-respecting scientist, uh, yeah. and I've known scientists, plenty of scientists, there is tremendous humility and self-doubt and, you know, uh, questioning every single step and every assumption. Uh, and, but that's not what's heard when you're talking about an expert. An expert is an absolute 100% author authority on facts, but that's not how experts work, actually. If we're talking about scientists, you know, they doubt everything they say, and they they're ready to abandon ideas uh, uh, if they're given sufficient evidence. And that's not in the public discourse. It gets this image of, of the expert becomes caric caricaturized and and then used politically. So that I think is an important dynamic, social dynamic that needs to be part of the discussion. I don't know any reactions to that. Absolutely. Very, very important point. You're absolutely right that, um, well, you know, I, I don't think uh, from what I've seen that the um, problem is so much that, you know, science, as you say, it's not the scientists themselves who give the impression of certainty and lack of doubt. Uh, it, what you were suggesting is that there's a way in which experts are portrayed by the media or by the government or something as being 100% certain of something and recommending it without any reservations. Um, now, I think it, to the extent to which there is an issue about communication per se, that is the issue. Because we saw in the United States that if the CDC came out and said, look, we're not entirely sure what's going on, but we think on balance, let's say you should wear a mask. People get confused. They think, well, I don't know. Are you telling me to wear a mask or are you telling me not to wear a mask? It's as though in order to 
be effective in implementing a policy, you have to present it as being much more certain than it actually is. And that too, it seems to me, may be a problem of education. Uh, because if you knew, as I say about science, you would know that there's a difference between truth and credence. And, you, and you're trying to establish something to be true and you know, the evidence will only take you as far as a certain credence that it's true. It is always the possibility that it's false, that it will be superseded by some future discovery or some future consideration. And, um, you know, ideally, your ideal citizen would again be just like you and me, somebody who knows that the deliverances of science are never 100% certain, that if somebody comes to you and says, it's not 100% certain, but on balance, we think that wearing masks reduces spread. And so you should do so, and you should wear this kind of mask. You say, yes, I was not looking for 100% certainty. I was looking for um, uh, you know, uh, a, a very high credence, and you gave me that. Now, the fact is, as I say, the, the citizens we are producing seem to be unable to handle this kind of expression of uncertainty. That is a problem. It's a problem that should be fixed again by education. It's not a big deal to be told, listen, we're not dealing in certainties here. We're dealing in probabilities. And uh, once you know how to deal with probabilities, it's not a problem. This is not rocket science. This is basic. Thank you. Carlene? Um, yes, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, in advance, you know, it's been three long days, so if my question reflects that I missed or misunderstood something, <laughs> apologies in advance. Um, so I've heard you talk a lot about education in high school, and I was just wondering, you know, um, taking myself as example, there's a lot of things that I forgot since high school <laughs> or that I've, um, ha I'm thinking about otherwise now. So I was just wondering, um, especially for people who don't choose careers, but they keep reflecting on these kinds of issues. Mm. Um, if you are also uh, are considering ways of educating the public in other ways beyond formal education. So I don't know. Um, you know you, sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, sorry, please, please finish. Yeah, so that was um, one part of the question. And then related to that, um, again, the focus seems very much on how uh, knowledge production in science, and um, I was also wondering, this goes back to the point of benevolence that's been brought up already a few mm. times, um, whether this education should perhaps extend to more, less factual things, um, well, I might be misphrasing this, but in this, that perhaps, had given that a lot of conspiracy theories and, and stuff like this, it also has a lot of to do with how group thinking of us versus them, and people being threatened in their identity or th things like that, um, where the values don't align with, I don't know. Anyway, my point was, <laughs> if, if that education should perhaps also um, deal somehow with, I don't know, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but perhaps sort of optimism or the idea that not everyone is <laughs> out to get you, or if, if, if it doesn't have to do just with how science works, but also perhaps that people are, um, perhaps a little bit more benevolent that you might think. <laughs> Saying that as a cynical person. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, let me take the second uh, part first. Um, um, the education should extend to less factual things. Um, Sorry, it, there, there are different ways of reading that. I mean, what, what, the thing about um, groupthink and the way in which uh, people coalesce around a certain belief, okay? I understand that, that, I understand that. I understand there are communities, I understand that they bind together in a certain way, uh, they coalesce around something. It's very surprising to me, and should I think be surprising to everyone, that they are coalescing around vaccine resistance or they're coalescing around climate change denial. These are, this is a very strange, you can look, you can coalesce around abortion, you know, 
That's very easy to understand to, around a moral value, a creed, a religion, coalesce around that. But to coalesce on a proposition that if you knew anything would know the proposition's truth is best settled by experts of a certain kind and cannot be done by you. It cannot be done by a politician, you know. So this is, so that's a mystery already. Uh, and and I, again, I believe, why is it that you and I don't do that? I'll tell you why. We understand, we understand something about these propositions and their difference from moral values, their difference from religion, their difference from other things that you can coalesce around. So that's number one. Um, um, I, you, you know, this is a very interesting point. You, you say, look, you can have received a great education in high school, but you know, this, these things do degrade over time, we forget. Um, it seems to me that on these very important matters, which concern not just the future of the globe and democracy and so on and so forth, uh, I mean, if it's necessary to reinforce that people should be applying the same methods in thinking about uh, these large issues that have an impact on um, the country and the globe, as they would use to figure out what went wrong with their car. Um, yes, well, if we need to reinforce that, I think that should be reinforced. Um, uh, um, you know, uh, it, 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 it can clearly lead us to very, very bad places unless we attend to that. But it seems to me that there is something very simple to be attended to there. I'd like to remind uh, people on Zoom that they can unmute themselves, come, come on camera and ask their questions if they so would wish. Uh, you're, we, we would very much welcome you to join in the conversation. Uh, Alain has given me permission to go a bit further with this uh, very interesting uh, give and take between the audience and vir the virtual poll. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I still can't see anyone online asking questions. So there is a question here in, in the hall. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more about uh, the issue of uh, whether education is, uh, you know, what, uh, what kind of effect it's going to have um, on uh, displacing irrational beliefs. Um, one issue that Professor Wickforce mentioned in her keynote address was the fact that sometimes it is socially advantageous to maintain a certain belief um, and to not uh, seek out alternative sources of information. And so uh, if that is still going to be a part of a uh, the culture that we have, where there are certain echo chambers, certain cliques of people, um, and within that, within those groups, having these beliefs is of social advantage. It may be practically rational to maintain those beliefs because, uh, well, it's, it's not in your interest to change your mind or, or uh, question it. And so, yeah, I just wonder if, um, if that is something you think is still going to be dealt with, uh, with improved education? Well, look, for, uh, you know, first of all, I should say, um, I am not an education expert. I mean, there really is, there are education experts and I have, I've had come to have by thinking about this issue, new appreciation for um, the, both the, the, the people who are specialists in, in education, also people who think about the philosophy of education. Um, uh, and uh, it's something, it seems to me that we relatively neglect in philosophy and that there really ought to be a lot more about that. Um, but, you, you know, so, but so, of course, you're asking me a complex empirical question. Will doing such and so have such and such effect? Okay. And uh, the, obviously, these any empirical question requires study and especially one on that's a very complex counterfactual 
Um, so I don't have the immediate answer to that. All I can say to you is, I mean, I, I do have the following answer, which I would like to give, is you can just extrapolate from your own case um, and ask yourself, why is it that you, or by and large, the people you know, don't fall prey? Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe you can make, give me counter evidence to that. But by and large, you know, I would not pick a scientifically um, a, 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 a complex proposition of science for which there will be evidence and for which there will be a fact of the matter as to whether it's true or false to coalesce around. That's that's the, the principal mystery is not. Is, is, is not that there are communities and that they bind themselves in certain ways, it's why they would pick these propositions. Ones that if you knew how they worked, you would know that there is a fact of the matter about them and you don't have the evidence and you should be asking the people who really have the evidence. So, you know, when these questions arise for you, you are not puzzled. If they, these questions can arise for you about Bitcoin, even though you're a highly educated person. It's the contrast between those two cases, it seems to me, that we really need to understand. So there are cases where even the most educated people will not know what to think. Bitcoin is my, my favorite example. And there is a reason for that. The reason is that it's new, the scientific consensus on it has not settled down, and so we don't know who to ask and who, who's right. Now, we don't feel that way about a range of other propositions because we know that they're not of the kind who's, um, for whom uh, the evidence is unclear and we, we are also not confused about who has the evidence. So, uh, of course, you know, there will be all of these practical reasons for binding with certain groups and not others. But if we had people who knew how to think about these things, they would not choose these propositions to be the ones that they coalesce around. That's the thing that, um, now, if you ask me, you know, will an education suffice for that? All I can say is it sufficed in my case, it sufficed in your case, it sufficed in all the, <laughs> probably all the people in this room, more or less. Um, and that's what we need to replicate. So there are lots of questions still. Alain, you tell me when to stop. Uh, there, right. Yes, there's, but we first, and Paul, how, how about you? Can you go on a bit longer? Yes, it's only 9.30. In, uh... Okay, right, yeah, the day hasn't started in New York yet. But I'm going to go online first to Pixel 5. Maybe you can identify yourself, show your face, and tell us your name, and then ask your question. Hi, hello, my name is Monica Gallegos and I had a point to make. Um, you know, considering that the government in North America is very pushy towards their bipartisan political party, right? People are kind of put in a box and adding to that, that confirmation bias that is so easy to get online, I can come with any type of far-fetched like subject and in 30 minutes I can find like several websites you know backing up my insane claim and how the education system in the states clearly it's not getting any better my question is do you believe that it's you know like this is a situation that is going to get worse before it gets better <laughs> Very good question. Thank you for that question, Monica. Um, again, this, these are, you know, uh, it, it's um, um, these are um, empirical questions to which uh, I, I I'm not particularly expert. Actually, one one of the things we can do is see here's I know enough to know that this is not a question on which I am expert, and I need to turn to an expert for help. If I were to turn to an expert for help. I would ask certain questions of the people who study education in the School of Education here at NYU. 
Um, and I don't know, my sense is that things are getting worse by the day, I mean, for what it's worth. But, um, but you know, it's going to take a very big investment in non-university education. And it's, you know, we're talking about a vast country, huge sums of money are involved, and uh, you, you have to train teachers and so on and so forth. So it's not a simple proposition. <laughs> that I'm uh, explaining, but of course, I'm not looking into all the practicalities. I'm just saying what it seemed to me that there was a much simpler phenomenon that underlies all the different things people are talking about, the echo chambers and the, for the, the group solidarity and so on and so forth, um, that what lies at the heart of all of that is, is something um, more basic. So I'm going to allow three more questions, but please make it quick so that we have time for our reception as well. <laughs> and thank you. Sorry, Paul, you can't join us. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, thanks very much uh, for your talk. Uh, so I, I want to believe that education is the uh, silver bullet, but I, I, I have doubts. And so my, my, my question is going to be, so Australia, I think, has a pretty good uh, high school system by international uh, standards. Um, but up until a couple of years ago, Australia also had a climate skeptic prime minister who was the head of the biggest and most successful party. He was also a Rhodes Scholar. Um, and his party only just got voted out after like 15 years in power. And it strikes me that that means that either Australians are particularly stupid or they're particularly irrational or they're particularly self-interested. But whatever the answer is, it doesn't seem to me like it's a lack of education. So I'm just wondering how we should kind of gel up data like that and whether that's uh, maybe a cause for pessimism. Thanks. Yeah, as I, I think I mentioned that the situation, uh, as far as the studies show, that there's a huge impact of education on vaccine hesitancy and on believing the election lie and much less of an impact on people's beliefs about uh, climate change. Luckily, the numbers are that 70% um, uh, believe that climate change is real and 30% don't, but that doesn't seem to shift, that proportion doesn't shift as much uh, with education um, as it does in the other cases. And so there's an interesting question about that. I mean, you can see what the, uh, what the, um, possible explanations could be. I mean, this thing is happening at, at, at a pace that's not immediately visible. It, the climate goes through different kinds of cycles. People have all been familiar with the idea that, uh, that um, uh, there are cycles to this. And also, you know, you might think that the bad effects are uh, so much further down the line that the inconvenience of uh, living with this kind of restraint uh, would be terrible. So there are possible explanations for why people would deviate from what rationality would require them to do in this particular case. And I, I don't know what the exact, uh, but I noted myself that there was much less of an impact on, uh, on uh, the climate change question than on the others. Thank you. I'm going to give the last question to Melanie Altanian, another diaspora Armenian here. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, great talk and lovely to meet you <laughs> in a way. Um, so uh, you made the diff uh, this distinction between factual and practical questions, but um, it seems to, there seems to be a vicious circle, right? Especially when I think about vaccine denial or hesitancy or, or generally the pandemic context. Um, um, there seem to be examples where people just don't want to give in to fear. Um, so there seems to be motivated reasoning first and then um, you know denial and then comes rationalization of that belief that they um, acquired through motivated reasoning, right? Um, and then they, of course, by through this rationalization process, they seek evidence for their beliefs uh, and so on. And that's when they find all these experts that you know they're not supposed to believe. But um, yeah, so so um, I guess yeah, it's more like a, a question about uh, about those cases, because that doesn't seem to be a problem about knowing which experts to choose, uh, but the problem of uh, 
yeah, I guess motivated reasoning and believing what one wants to believe. Um, and I don't think we can uh, resolve that by education or. Well, as I say, I, I said uh, right at the start, uh, there will there will even with education, there will clearly still be motivated reasoning, motivated irrationality. Um, and, um, um, you know, that that's the feature of psychology <laughs> that isn't going away and we all suffer from it under certain circumstances, as, as I say, especially when emotion is involved. But what are the cases that you had in mind? I don't think you mentioned any examples. Um, oh, you don't have the mic now. I was wondering what examples, what examples you had in mind where... Hello. Uh, vaccine hesitancy, for example, are not uh, are basically um, denying the safety right. of vaccines. So the story in terms of uh, in terms of wishful thinking, by the way, for vaccine hesitancy, I don't even know how to tell that story. I mean, look, you know, with climate change, wish the the wishful thinking can play a very big role because there is a huge cost associated with believing that climate change is real. You have to change your habits. You have to you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe boycott companies that are producing uh, the carbon footprint and so on and so on and so on. You might feel guilty about taking a flight. I mean, there are many, many costs. Here you have a vaccine that you know is killing millions of, I mean, you have a disease that's killing millions of people, okay. And um, you have uh, all this evidence that, um, the vac taking the vaccine protects you. It protects you from hospitalization and death. Now, why would, why would you have this wishful thinking that, that would want the, 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 this potential savior to be false? I mean, I don't understand the story. In the case of climate change, I can see why people would want to resist that proposition. But if somebody says to you, there's this horrible disease that's killing all these people, including some of your family and friends, uh, but we have found something that has a chance of uh, really diminishing the effects of this. Why is your wishful thinking that this be a lie? I don't understand this. Well, I guess it usually goes together with denying that the, the virus is actually really as deadly as they make it seem. So okay, that's another yeah. mystery, right? Um, Again, it's a mystery about not listening to the right people, but it boils down to, you know, the question of who should you listen to? Who is it rational for you to listen to? And how could you be so confused about that? So um, if, if, you know, as I say, why are you not confused about that? You're not confused about that because you know a certain amount about the institutions of science. So on um, that rather pessimistic note, maybe we should call our conference to an end and thank first and foremost, Paul Bogosian for an excellent talk and very patient engagement with us. Thank you, Paul, wonderful.